Hello everybody and you're super welcome to today's conversation around what does it mean to be a woman entrepreneur today. My name is Susan hayes Culliton, and I too am a woman entrepreneur, very proud of that and have been over a decade at this stage. But you are going to hear from two fantastic women entrepreneurs who have an awful lot to say on this topic. So what I'm going to do is first of all set the scene and let's just shape our conversation by taking a look around Ireland and indeed further afield look at the world around us today by doing a quick pestle analysis. So pestle is a stakeholder management tool and it's an analytical tool as well of how we can observe and set the scene for conversations like this. So P is for political. There is great political support for women Women entrepreneurship today we can see that in the supports that are being offered in the way in which industry can collaborate with universities like we see here at TU Dublin as well as the range of occasions and experiences that are offered to women entrepreneurs today to really and truly elevate that position and then E E is for the economic impact well in Ireland, broadly speaking, of course, while women do represent 50% of the population, in general, what we do see is that women represent around about 45% of the labour force, but represent 70% of those in part-time employment. So there is huge economic impact of the role that women play within the economy, and there are nuances that are definitely worthwhile considering. And then S. S is for social. Well, what we have seen over, a pre over our previous couple of months and years, of course, is a really big shift towards working from home and then progressively towards hybrid working. In many ways, this can help the proliferation of women entrepreneurship because there is more flexibility built in from a physical point of view. And then T, T is for technological. Of course, there is huge developments being made in technology that can aid women entrepreneurs, including, for example, video conferencing and more and more expectation now that conversations take place online as opposed to, again, physically needing to be there. Cloud collaboration, artificial intelligence, and again, that whole idea of exploration into technology by universities like TU Dublin collaborating with industry are all supporting that. When we look at L, L is for legal, we do see that there has been a huge amount of legal work done to level up the field on a legal basis for women entrepreneurs and women in business and women generally in the workplace. However, of course, what needs to be coupled with legal is cultural and that also is part of the challenge but part of our opportunity to trailblaze. And then finally, E, E is for environmental. There is a massive demand these days for greater sustainability and it's coming from everywhere. Whether it is from more and more funding going into ESG, which is Environmental, Social and Governance Investment, whether it is companies having to meet pretty strict carbon budgets, whether it comes from a supranational level like the UN or the EU, there is more and more obligation all the time for us to come up with innovative solutions to make our lives and our businesses, our organisations, our governments and the way we live and work today more sustainable. So that really does set the scene for what it does look like around the world when we think about being a woman entrepreneur, not just looking internally, but externally, not just looking domestically, but looking internationally. And of course, not just looking at this individually, but collectively. So on that note, I'm now going to hand you over to Dr. Diane Tagney, and she is from Atmos Q, and she's going to tell us a little bit about her and her journey to where she is today. Thank you very much, Susan. I'm Dr. Diane Tangney, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about my journey so far. And my journey has been one of creativity, innovation and ideas. I began my career in advertising agencies in the US and then in Ireland, facilitating teams, interdisciplinary teams to come up with ideas. So uh, on reflection, my career from a very early stage and right up to today has always been about creativity and always about um, creative collaboration and, and how do you bring different skills together to come up with ideas. I founded my first company in 2010 and that was a creativity and innovation consultancy. And in that company, I was facilitating creativity and innovation and idea generation for large organizations. I was helping them with new product development, solving problems with interdisciplinary teams, running design thinking sprints, and, and really doing what I now do for myself for other people. Um, my company, Atmos Q, is a technology startup. And what I'm doing is actually just the same. I'm bringing different skills together, hardware engineers, software engineers, environmental scientists, different skills together 
to solve problems that I myself cannot. And this passion for creative collaboration of mine took me on an academic journey as well. Along the way, when I had my consultancy, uh, Soul Tradership, so I was on my own in that, I decided to also study creative collaboration so that I could understand more about how do different disciplines come together to come up with ideas. So after nine years studying in TU Dublin and funding that through my own company, um, I delivered a PhD, um, which contributed new knowledge about how breakthroughs happen with different disciplines. There have been a lot of highs and lows along the way. Some of the lows for me are when I get isolated, when I don't have sufficient interaction with others and I start feeling isolated, feeling untethered. I start doubting myself. So those are red flags for me that I know that isolation is a trigger for me that I need to address um, because these can lead to low points and, and actually getting a little bit lost along the way. Some of the highs along the way um, come from external validation, things like getting press coverage, being accepted onto an accelerator program or an incubator program, um, receiving funding. Um, these external accolades are, are, are certainly a, a high, but they're, they're a minor one in my view. The real highs that come from for me and my experience have been the personal wins. The ones, I can't control external validation, but the ones that have come from my own hard work and from the work of my team around me, those have been, those have been the highs. Uh, when things suddenly start to work, when we've achieved a milestone, when we've gotten over a hurdle, they're the wins. And because they're not public, they still need to be celebrated. You need to pause at those and, and be proud of them. So those have been some of the, the really powerful highs or the ones that many others might not see. Um, and if I was giving advice to others, in particular, I found that one of my triggers for low points was isolation. So I would say, look out for your own Achilles heel. What is it? What starts making you doubt yourself? What starts making you um, get a bit untethered or um, slow down or become daunted? Find those triggers. They're not going to go away, but you can manage them. You can spot them and manage them. So, so that's a piece of practical advice. And then also celebrate the wins just because they're not public. They're wins and they're potent and celebrate. Give yourself a pat on the back and, and celebrate with your own team. Um, I talk a lot about creativity and one of the things that I often talk about is that it's not how creative you are because that's comparative. It's about how are you creative and that's different for each one of us and that's my other piece of advice. Where are you creative? When are you creative? What environments are you creative in? And if you understand that and think about your own creati creativity and how you are creative, then you'll be able to channel that. You'll be able to foster it. You'll be able to harness it in your own company and in your own pursuit. So I think um, thinking about creativity is a valuable thing to do. And I have this belief, and it's this, it's that the creativity between us is more powerful than the creativity within us. Imagine that, that the creativity between us is more powerful than the creativity within us. And if that's true, and I believe it is, then creative collaboration is essential to solving the problems that we need to solve. And in my life studies, in my life's work, creative collaboration has been at the heart of everything. The other thing about uh, the times we're currently in is that the problems are all interconnected. So we can't solve them on our own. And so the big challenges need different skills to come together to do that. Now, there are many platforms in place to help us, particularly as startups. We have a vibrant startup community with co-working spaces, incubators, accelerators, funding mechanism, supports, and increasingly so for women entrepreneurs. So the, the foundations are in place to support us. As Susan mentioned earlier on, 
the communications tools are there, the collaboration tools, um, like the video conferencing, but also um, finding communities of practice, uh, interest groups in your sector uh, of interest, and finding um, industry bodies by Googling or LinkedIn and finding those groups is possible on on a grand scale. Meeting in person will be is is a welcome return, and more of those requ- those connections are required to collaborate. I think a lot of work has been done to connect universities, uh, businesses, startups, but I think more can be done there because, to me anyway, those processes, those um, platforms are opaque and daunting and complex. So I think that still needs to be demystified. How do I find the skills that I don't have? How do I connect them into my organization? And likewise, how do I connect the skills in my organization into other organizations? So I think there's still a journey to take that from really, really big stuff um, into more accessible, more meaningful, more connections. So I think there's there's more there's a way more to go in terms of connecting different companies, different startups. Sometimes we're all solving the same problems, and that's a bit silly when we could actually connect and and overcome the common problems, and then focus on the the ones that that still need to be solved. That makes sense to me. I talk a lot about creative collaboration. And it's not easy. Bringing different disciplines together is hard. Sometimes there's communication issues because we have different areas of expertise. Um, We're certainly barriers to entry in terms of if I'm working with uh, an engineer in an area that I know very little about, it's hard for me to keep up. So their barriers can sometimes be high to interact with other disciplines. So I think you need humility. I think you need courage and I think you need curiosity and motivation to want to engage with these other disciplines because it is easier not to. But where the breakthroughs will come from is when you bring different disciplines together in common pursuit. Uh, I think women are incredible collaborators. We form networks. We make connections. We bring people together. We do this in our personal lives. And we do this in our professional lives. And I think we're really well placed in the world that we're in today to bring different skills, different disciplines together in common pursuit. Thank you very much indeed for that, Diane. And I think you give us a really clear message out of that, which is around common pursuit, bringing people together towards a common pursuit. And that is, I think, the nugget that we really need to take out of that. A couple of things that really stood out to me around what you said and the first one is something that you mentioned very very early on is that you spoke about design thinking sprints. Now for those of you who are joining us maybe you haven't been involved in an innovative process before or maybe you're thinking how do I come up with an idea or if I have an idea how do I come up with an action plan around it. There is actually a specific step-by-step guide to doing it and a design thinking sprint can be a great way of doing that so check that out. It's a really useful way that many consultants use but also I've used them many times and when you can rely on a process it takes away the uncertainty so that you can channel your energy into thinking in a design way. The second thing that you mentioned as well and I don't think we hear this very often, is that you know your own red flags. The self-awareness that you picked up on there is knowing that isolation isn't good for you. And therefore, surrounding yourself with people, virtually or otherwise, is something that you know that you need to do, but you know that, and you can act on that. And then on the other hand, you also mentioned about the high points comes from validation. And again, you can go out of your way to find that. Maybe it is through applying for uh, a process like New Frontiers or joining something like that. Maybe it is like you mentioned if you're in the press. Maybe it is engagement on social media. But again, the fact that you know that is really important. And again, I would invite people who are watching today, watch out for your own highs and lows. What as you heard Diane mention there, what triggers them? And then oh, know how to mitigate the ones that can trigger the negative side and pursue the ones that you can trigger on the positive side. The third thing, love your question. It's not how creative are you, but how are you 
creative. And the reason I really like that sentence is you took the same four words and just changed them around a little bit, is that it changes the nature of the question. Is that rather than trying to measure something, and what's worse, rather than feeling that you're not measuring up in some way when you're comparing yourself against some sort of benchmark that may or may not exist, instead it's looking at where is the best? How are you creative? How can you bring that creativity to what you're working on? It just changes the question around from rather than a measurement against something to looking positively and simply looking for that creativity and harnessing it. So thank you so much indeed for your insights and there's going to be lots more I'm sure from you during the panel discussion. But before we get to that, I would now like to introduce our second speaker and she is another fantastic entrepreneur. Her name is Geraldine Magner from Idaro. And now, Geraldine, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Susan. I'm delighted to be here today. I am co-founder and director of an indigenous tech company called Iter Analytics. We help our clients to predict their customer behavior. And so in a nutshell, wherever there is data, there's an asset that we can bring enormous value to our client. And we do that at huge scale, having analyzed 15% of the world's population to date. In 1999, after I graduated from TU Dublin, um, myself and six other college buddies, we headed to New York um, for that year. The years that followed New York, for sure, were a blended pot of entrepreneurial efforts rather than achievements with jobs along the way. I became a waitress, a law student, a business teacher, economics lecturer, a display artist, a marketeer. Um, I set up a specialist recruitment company. I became an actress. I even started a bread business in Italy. Um, then eight years later, age 30, I found myself in California. That was about 2006. Turns out that I found myself in amongst fascinating people who thought I was great for my eclectic CV. Because in 2006, I was lost in Ireland. But in California, I felt I'd landed somewhere where I was understood. Because failure there was considered a stepping stone to success rather than a dead end. I was enlivened by this can-do attitude at the time. So myself and the two other co-founders, we went to Silicon Valley in search of that elusive term sheet to raise investment and to court the venture capitalists that were awash with deep financial pots of money. The three of us, we were so broke, failure was not even an option. We did the VC rounds for a year on a wing and a prayer to no avail, came home in vain, worse than broke, and only now more indebted to some um, loved ones. What led us to the US initially was that the VC appetite in Ireland was weak at the time and very bit part. But the background to this story is important because a year prior to going to um, the US, a German company, an investor, had invested one million in us. The one million was split over two tranches. First half came with specific spend target, targets. Second half never came as the VC portfolio that we and 26 other companies was sold off. The new portfolio owner had no knowledge of our business and therefore no interest. This is a real example of an injection of bad money because if we were like a plane, they gave us enough fuel to take off, fly high, but stop short to give us fuel to land. In a determined effort to pay and honour our debts, we strived and failed behind the scenes and won a little sometimes typically over the course of a, a 60 to 70 hour week. Any win never felt whole as we were starting from minus rather than zero. We were lucky that what we did appealed to blue chip clients, so such as telcos or utilities. So a bad debtor was never a worry. We negotiated for early deals and as pioneers in an unknown space, we spent much of our wins on educating the market and enterprise sales in large organizations that we were selling into typically took anything from 12 to 18 months before revenue came in. And this is a protracted period where too many variables can and did go wrong in the deal flow. Then in 2009, just as we were about to run out of cash uh, again, we caught the interest of a multinational who sought to buy us out. As you may know, with any merger or acquisition, the due diligence is a huge demand in a business. We were excited, staff were excited, as many staff had been paid in share options and D-Day had arrived finally. I'd slept at my desk that weekend as the final push to get legals, et cetera, over the line, exhausted but relieved. We were now about to be wealthy and very wealthy. That Monday evening, 
rather than bursting opening a much anticipated bottle of champagne, we were in shock, left in shock because on the 11th hour prior to the acquisition becoming legal, they pulled the plug. I missed my best friend's wedding in France because of the weekend at the desk, but I was broke. I was broke in the bank, broke in the head, and now broke in the heart. Um, we had been set up as IBM bought out our acquirer. They didn't reveal, but placed us on hold against um, T's and C's. We ended up in court against a giant. We were told in an Irish court that we would have to put a huge amount in escrow just for the, for the case to be heard. The big giant had won because the small company couldn't prove to pay the legal fees, although we had been the ones working inside the law. The repercussions of that fall was a blow to staff morale. C CVs went out the door. A great business once again on its knees because of matters outside the course of its business. So we had to lick our wounds again. Um, and we didn't want to default all of the people who believed in us and we had debt to repay. So after we got knocked down, we got up. No wind at our back, only sheer might and determination. Got a contract, with, which was lucky, um, with the largest telco operator in Northern America. That bought us 12 months runway. I was a CFO at the time, so I knew every penny and line item intimately. I had a sales guy who was uh, going to London to meet a customer and he bought his breakfast and newspaper on the plane. When he came back with the receipt, I said to him, I'm not paying for the, the newspaper. Um, I said it wasn't mandatory. Um, so <laughs> that's, how t that's how tight things were for us. And when you're CFO at times like that, I was definitely the least popular person in the company. But every cent counted and every phone call to communicate, payment issues mattered to keep the business going. Um, a delay from this telco in the States happened because they refused to pay into a bank account that was an Irish one. So this was now Christmas 2010. I had to get salaries out. I went to the bank, our own bank here in Ireland, with the purchase order that proved that $850,000 was en route. I asked for an overdraft extension of just €10,000 to cover off the shortfall for salaries for the employees. Um, we, as founders, yet again, couldn't afford to pay ourselves. The banks said no. <laughs> A check um, was in transit from the largest telco in the US, and our bank said no. Now, we were definitely part of the financial crisis and victims of it with that type of um, reaction from our bank even though we as a business were starting to bloom. I pulled off another stroke that got us through. It would be the first of many le lessons in robbing Peter to pay Paul. So now in 2011, the banks, given that it was a financial crisis, the banks were not open for business to small businesses and certainly not technology ones. We looked abroad to outsource research and development and innovation because of the untenable costs of salaries in the tech industry here. So another thing that had happened with the, many of the larger multinationals were poaching our staff because our staff skill sets were exactly what they needed for their analytics departments. We were nurseries, training staff for multinationals that we couldn't compete on salary numbers with. So staffing became a crisis for us then. Um, we developed, after that, we developed a leading edge technology that brought us to pioneer and leader status again, with a significant cost to us because it was self-funded. We lost out on not getting it to the market. The cost of that development is it was one thing. What the cost of getting a product to the market is another. And we hadn't quite sussed the latter part until too late. So we were stupidly throwing good money after bad. So again, cash flow became a, a monthly challenge. When I was an employee myself, payday was always too far away on a four-week cycle but then as an employer I was like what what do you mean it's the end of the month again so as CFO I came to dread the last Friday of each month challenged um, in the background of lack by, with lack of cash but the game face was had to be to, to be kept to keep confidence and good energy afloat amongst us all I remember one time very dependent on a tax rebate from revenue for cash but I had to have Back in those days, you had to have a tax certificate to trigger the release of the cash to our account, even though it was money owed to us. And you could only get a new cert issued if all your tax affairs were in order. And mine was a, um, a month behind. So on a particular mon <laughs> Monday morning, I was running to Dublin airport trying to catch a plane to the States. And I was deliberately last in the line because I was negotiating with the tax man to give me a new cert so that I could draw down the money owed to me and the over and back, break out of sweat. And 
It was because that was the last moment to get cash for the payroll of the, the month coming. Getting on the plane, I was like really in a state, smiling to the air hostess because I was the last one to the seat. Um, I then was on, practically on the ground whispering to the tax man, look, can you give me the search? And then the air hostess is saying, all mobile devices off. The tax, tax man eventually agreed. And he says, I'll send it on to you later on this afternoon. And I said to him, no, I need it right now. Please call it out to me over the phone. He agreed. I kid you not, my pen wouldn't work. I used the fabric of the upholstery on the back of the seat to draw my finger the shape of the certain numbers. I had to get off the phone then but the, because the plane was taking off. And I was in trouble with Aerostis because I wasn't belted up. I was sitting there going, my God, okay, dialing the number to my colleague. And because I, I couldn't text properly, I was whispering down at my legs going, here's the numbers for the search. Please put it into the revenue system right now to release the tax refund. I remember my heart thumping. And it wasn't because it was takeoff. It was because another month's lifeline had been saved for our business. And I guess you are truly an entrepreneur only when you have to pay another person's salary. Now, so let's let's move then beyond the financial crisis. 2013 was a reset, a reboot. I, and I'm going to put these years in just to give you a linear view of my journey. 2014, I got married. 2015, had my first child, second one in 17. My maternity periods were the most valuable times in my career to the business because I took massive learnings from an imposed, put upon um, time out. Um, I saw it eventually as my time where I was sharpening the saw. Um, so we got the show on the road again and many of the learnings um, helped us. The markets had changed as well by 2000 and uh, 15, 16. You know, there was there was we were moving from hardware to software, open source, cloud infrastructures. So we rebuilt the business at that point to being a huge success um, that in 2019, we were finally able to say that we had a growth rate of 30 percent increase year on year for the previous three years. And as we all know, COVID hit. Yes, it was a total knockout again. So we'll just go beyond that because that's a very much a shared experience for all businesses. So back on track and doing our best ever, not because it is easier or the costs of business have come down or policies have improved, but because we finally used all our failures and our experiences as an asset and stopped apologizing for existing as a company that evidently should have died off on numerous occasions. I'm glad to say to date we have funded organically and internally taking no VC, VC funding to bring us to where we are now. As a leader in my own organization, I have come to honor that serial entrepreneur in me after all. That description that once made me giggle is now an inner resource. So when things go wrong in business, and they will, I have been there before in failure and I'm familiar with it. I now know it to be a stepping stone, not a dead end. And please don't like worry about your exact, you know, exact pathway. We all have different ones. <laughs> um, so yours may not be like mine, but do know the failures are, it's a progression. Um, I know probably you're wondering what my entrepreneurial journey, like why didn't you just go do yourself a favor and take the grand nine to five job? It'd be easier, less trustful, surely. Um, well, maybe for some, but no matter what um, you're enterprising about, it's a gift, a gift that allows you to use all parts of your brain, the creative, emotional, and the analytical. And above all else, you're the captain of your own ship. I get to wake up every morning with a spring in my step. Because in my work world, I have co-created a space with the type of people I want to work with and be surrounded by my own tribe, so to speak. Um, meet people in the world I could never have imagined existed. And the most exciting aspect of it is having my own mind blown away by their thoughts and their vantage points. And also, of course, mixing with like minded people. Um, there's no day that's a groundhog day. No boredom. Yes, plenty of frustration. And I suppose also as an entrepreneur, the pace of change is determined by you. You design and choose the ambience, ethos and your work environment. And of course, I don't have to fit into a box and conform. When somebody says to me, think outside the box, I say, there is no box. Um, I'm not before you today as an entrepreneurial hero or heroine like Steve Jobs or Mark Zuckerberg, but I am and sorry, and I, nor am I a large success story. I have no crescendo to this entrepreneur's journey like, oh, we did a 30 million sellout. 
what, what I do have, and I stand before you and tip you largely with this thought, I am a successful entrepreneur because I literally love life and I love my life, my independence, my freedom from nonconformity. If I get to go to bed every night having honored my values, I'm very successful because being integrity is a soft pillow to sleep on. And a good night's sleep is always a win. So look, fellow entrepreneurs, there will be highs and lows, and that is normal. The dark nights of the soul you will have to encounter are not signals of you personally failing. But I implore you to do a few things that will mind you along the way. Before you start your entrepreneurial journey, define for you what success means and make it about you. No comparisons to others. And going back to my song that I quoted at the start, here's another line from it. Sometimes you're ahead, sometimes you're behind. The race is long, and in the end, it is only with yourself. So apart from anything else, this is, this is your, your success is all that matters here, or your definition of it. Also, as fellow female entrepreneurs to come, when they ask you for your business plan, do know that this is your life plan because it will become enmeshed for the startup years. So be kind to yourself and plan for your personal dreams too, such as family and relationships. They won't just happen when you are so entrepreneurially busy. They too need specific carve out times to make happen. For me personally, I really wanted to be a mother. I was always waiting for the right time, no cash flow problems, the right house, right area, business booming, life singing along. I'd still be waiting to have my kids if that was the criteria I upheld. But I am cognizant of this as a reference because I nearly did miss the boat and not have kids. And it would have been of my own making. Regret only what is out of your control. So your business plan as an entrepreneur should be called life plan. So have a second copy of it in your home with you with side annex inserts that mark out your elected times that you will Take to pursue your personal dreams and pursuits, whatever they are. This is key to loving your business and avoid resenting it in time to come. Another thing I'd like to add is always look out for the woman behind you. Give grace to her. She is doing her best, even if it's not your best. She may be running from you because she feels bad about herself. It is your duty as a fellow woman to look out for her as she has more demands on her than she will ever tell you or even her even admit to herself. You don't have to take on her woes, but quietly be compassionate. And relationships matter. Learn how to relate to people. Know that people are emotional and not always logical. So learn how to master and navigate the human race, especially in digital loudness like today, people still buy from people they like. So learn emotional intelligence. Um, work smart, not hard. We already know that you're capable and dedicated. So when you arrive to workhorse mode, that is the signal to pull back, to sharpen the saw, not to upskill, but to question your way of working or your way of thinking rather than measuring your frenetic pace of doing. And finally, be a strategic thinker rather than strategic planner. It won't put you off your game as much when change comes. In the words of Muhammad Ali, everyone has got a plan until they get a punch in the head. Thank you, my entrepreneurial colleagues, for your time today. Geraldine, what a story. My God, you tell that with such passion and with such authenticity, but also, again, just like in Diane's case, with such self-awareness. And you really take us through those narratives along the way that really document the highs and the lows that can, that can come along. A couple of things that I'd, I'd like to, to pick up on that I felt really stood out and there was so much. One of them is that story around not paying for the newspaper. <laughs> and certainly, there's no doubt about it, every cent matters, and right along the journey. But what I do think is an under, it's an underestimated anxiety reducer is knowing your cash flow statement. When you know what cash is expected to come in and go out and when, and you can plot that, in our case, we do it for a year ahead. When you can actually plot that forward, then you can see where there might be some red spots and you can take preemptive action, but also simply knowing along the way and having your scenario analysis, if you want to go that advanced level to say, what if something doesn't happen like you mentioned? So that intimate knowledge of your accounts, it's not just for the crack. It can really and truly make a big difference. The second thing that I felt really stood out about what you mentioned there was the massive learning curve that came from both of your maternity leaves. 
Now, personally, there's been a couple of times when I had to step outside of the business. One was when I got married. One was actually when I broke my foot and I couldn't, I was in crutches in a boot for a year. Now, I didn't have to step out for that long, but I was, my mobility was really challenged at the time. And there have been other times when I was really, really, really busy with one particular project, whether it was publishing a book or something that was soaking up my time. And it's interesting. I've often thought when my back is against the wall, how differently I act and how differently other people in the team can respond. And I've often thought to myself, I really need to be able to replicate those behaviours thereafter. So I agree with you, they can be massive learning curves. But you also mentioned about having that time out of the business enabled you to sharpen the saw. And that, by the way, that terminology is something that can be really interesting to think about. When you sharpen the saw, of course, then you can cut through things all the more effectively. So I would invite those listening today and viewing today is think about when do you get time to sharpen the saw and whether it's enforced, like a maternity leave will do, or whether you're actively taking them out. And the third thing is you mentioned about being successful because you honour your values and you spoke about integrity being a soft pillow to sleep on. That is ultimately what success is, isn't it? Is when you're doing what you love. And as you say, you live a life that you love. Of course, that is successful. And I would always say, is that success to you and what success might mean to me? They could be very different. Doesn't matter what the difference is, is important to me and respectively important to you. So similarly to all of you who are listening today, Diane and Geraldine's stories may be different. Your story will respectively be different. Success should always be on your own terms and indeed your value should be attributed to that. So Geraldine, thank you so much indeed for your honesty, your insights and the way in which you tell your story as well. Um, it's truly and truly entertaining in one way, but truly insightful and we can clearly see you've walked the walk and thank you for being here today to talk the talk with us. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite both Diane and Geraldine to come back and we're going to have a panel discussion. And I'm going to start off by asking you both, Diane, I'm going to go to you first. Can I just ask you, first of all, the theme today is what does it mean to be a woman entrepreneur today? And how do you react to that question? Well, I think, Susan, something you said already was that there's never a perfect time. Uh, this year, next year, last year, if you're waiting for a perfect time, you will be waiting. Um, there will never be more time and there will never be less uncertainty. That's for sure. So I think being an entrepreneur and being a woman entrepreneur in these times means you have to back yourself despite that context. You have to be brave. That doesn't mean fearless. I'm very fearful of many things, but I'm brave. And I would encourage you to be brave despite all of the moving parts that are beyond your control. So I, I, I think one is being brave. Um, and the other thing that I think is important is taking the opportunities and don't let them pass, even if it's not planned and it comes your way, whether it is that punch that Muhammad Ali talked about or whether it is something more subtle, don't let it pass. If something comes your way, grab it. It may not have been on the plan but that's okay. The plan is something that's changing all of the time. And I think to be a woman entrepreneur, you've got to be adaptable and changeable and flexible. And I think as women, we are all of the, those things and multitaskers, as cliche as it is, you move from one thing to the next quite easily. And that is a benefit in the entrepreneurial world. So if I could go to you now on that, Geraldine, in essence, what Diane has said is being, being brave, taking opportunities, being adaptable. That is what being a woman entrepreneur today means. What does it mean to you? Um, I suppose, I mean, I totally agree with everything Diana said. Um, I, I think the word freedom really shouts out at me as to what it was 25 years ago is when I graduated from uh, TU Dublin. And let's put it in context to the times that we're in it. Um, being an entrepreneur was something akin to madness. Like, why would you not go down the road of a far more predictable life? Um, also, as a woman, I felt um, observed in a very negative way. I remember being, you know, th there was a time when wolf whistling was still happening uh, commonly. And I remember being in a company and I thought to myself, how am I ever going to be in, 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 a, in a business or have a career? Because if men are making comments that's it was knocking it was really knocking my confidence on the inside and 
there was there was a lot more sexual innuendo that was allowed in our culture back then. That's I I would like to think that's not there now um, as much certainly. Um, also, I I go back to um, relationships matter. It's it's really great how we've embraced um, networking. There, there is collegiality outside your organization. There's plenty of business people who really want to help you. Um, just go out and meet them. Uh, I think we were a lot shyer of that as a nation in the last decade or so. So they've become new norms. And to me, also, there's more freedom of information. Um, so you can access a lot more um, assets uh, more easily and readily. So freedom is, is the word of, of what I would say now when I look back over my own career. And in many ways, that freedom extends in many directions now, whether it's the technology that allows us to work from everywhere or anywhere, whether it is also, of course, the understanding that people work at different times, so we're not locked into maybe that, that nine to five anymore. Correct. A lot, An awful lot of those things have changed. Diane, if I go back to you, as you mentioned, you talk about creative collaboration a lot. And on one hand, we have freedom to do everything. But also, of course, the freedom to do everything means that there isn't the rigidity to do any one thing. So you, you talked about, you know, the, the challenge that comes from trying to bring multiple different perspectives together, but aligning them on a common pursuit. Could you just take us through exactly what that looks like in practice and how we can lever that? being women entrepreneurs today? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you an example, of my closest example, which is my own company, AtmosQ. And AtmosQ is pioneering new uh, indoor air quality monitoring. Now, my expertise is in creative collaboration and bringing different disciplines together. But I've had to become, through this journey, an expert on indoor air quality. I have learned every day from engineers and from scientists and from uh, um, companies on how this works and, and how the journey. So one in terms of collaborating, learning, constant and continuous learning is part of it. In terms of developing a solution to this, and, and remember, I talked about I used to do this for other people. I used to help them solve problems. I used to help them come up with new ideas. So when you turn that on yourself, often the, the cobbler's children are the worst shot. Doing it for yourself, you suddenly start doubting what I did as a day job for everybody else. So sometimes I think it's harder to do your own skill set in your own business when that is your expertise. I've had to bring together environmental scientists to test in labs these new solutions. I've had to bring hardware engineers together. And remember, I'm the glue between the hardware engineers who we need to design a multi-zone valve and the environmental engineers who know nothing about the valve. And the, the valve guys know nothing about the environmental scientists. But I'm the link between the two of them. And then you bring in the software engineers who need to write code to make everything work. And they know nothing about the hardware and they know nothing about the environmental science. So, one, you need to bring different expertise together who may not understand what each other are doing and bring them together. But you need an understanding of it all. I, I am not a hardware engineer. I am not an environmental scientist and I'm not a software engineer. Yet I have had to learn the language of all of those people. I've had to lead all of those people in common pursuit. And I do it, I rely on process. And you mentioned design thinking. That is one process. And lean business. And how do you bring a new solution to market? So one, a process will support you. Uh, two is this understanding that it takes learning. It takes humility. Because if you're an expert in one area, by default, you're not an expert in the other area. So you have to defer and allow other expertise to come in and take over. So there's this fluidity to whoever is leading the process. OK, when we're really in a hardware engineering phase, that's you. You're up. Then I'm up because we're leading the commercialization and we're on an accelerator program. I'm leading this and you're all in behind me. So I think there's a fluidity uh, to it. And this uh, lifelong learning is the key that I now know more about all of these things that I ever thought I would. So it is doable and it is achievable. You've, you've got to be confident that it is learnable and you've got to be willing to learn. That sense of open-mindedness, I think, is underscoring all of this, is, you know, knowing that it's learnable, that it's doable. Um, but you have to be open to working with other people and in di different ways along the way. 
We talk a lot, or specifically in your own case, Geraldine, you spoke an awful lot there about achieving and pursuing and going after what you had wanted. Did you ever get in your own way? It's funny, I'm I'm now 45 and I've spent um, a while thinking about, I, I spent a while thinking about could I have got here faster? I, I kind of acknowledge that I have a lost decade and a lost decade for me is not that I... It was just that I, I, I should have asked for help more. I should have turned around and said to people that were on the path just before me, you're at the stage above me, help me, help me make this right decision. I stayed in the gray too long. Um, so one of the things I would say, you know, you can go the scenic route like I did, but stand on the shoulders of a giant and you, you learn from that instead of exhausting yourself um, and kind of shooting a lot in the dark. So, there were things I definitely got in my own way about. And one of the things I, I've seen come back in trend again as a discussion, and that is the imposter syndrome. And mm. there seems to be this collective acknowledgement that it's there. And then now that we've said it, it's there. It's kind of like, well, sure, we're all, we all have it. And to me, I would say to any um, entrepreneur, yeah, when it comes to becoming self-aware, acknowledging that you have something, don't just leave it sit there. Work your way through it. If you have the imposter syndrome, get rid of it um, and do whatever it takes to get rid of it rather than saying, yeah, I'm carrying it with me. Um, the other what, other things that would have I would have gotten my own way um, when I look back, and that is I didn't not for asking for help is one thing, but asking for the sale um, just being very, very straight with people, um, letting them know what it is that you want to achieve or whatever, that has helped me um, leap forward a lot by being clear, not just with my intention, but clear in my communication about what I want. So, yeah, I wish I had been more of an effective communicator back in the day. Um, you know, it's like that old adage, a quiet priest never got a parish. And by the way, <laughs> The only reason I kind of held back from asking at times is because I was afraid of no. And when you think right through that, so what if they say no? You're not dead after it. <laughs> it's mm. as simple as that. So I'd say to anyone, get over yourself. Get out of your own way. Just go for it. And if it doesn't go the way you want it, learn from it. That's it. Well, one of my favorite quotes, Geraldine, is if you win, you'll be successful. If you lose, you will be wise. And there is there is great opportunity, all right, even in the nose, because you can find out some, something along the way. Yeah. If we could maybe just take the conversation in a slightly different direction for a moment, Diane. I mean, you are Dr. Diane Tangney, and you mentioned that your PhD, that you studied it over nine years. Could you tell us what was it like to be a student, a PhD student at that, as well as leading a business. And in addition, did that academic path, was it parallel to the journey of your business? In other words, did one help the other or were they divergent? Was it that you had to focus on one and then kind of switch your brain off and switch it on in a, in a different direction? How does the interaction between academic, academia and business at the same time either help or detract from each other? Well, my PhD was a friend to me over the nine years, and that's how I, I, I thought of it. Sometimes we had fallings out, but um, it was a friend to me. And at the end of it, I did miss it. I still teach in TU Dublin on creative thinking, and I lectured throughout that period. But practically, let me just say, at the start of my PhD journey, I also started my innovation consultancy. So throughout those nine years, I funded my PhD, which I studied part time, by um, running my innovation consultancy also part-time. I, over those nine years, and I didn't quite mention that there were three babies along the way, which partially explains the nine years, um, along the way, more creativity. But those journeys running in parallel, because I was studying creative collaboration and how different disciplines come together to achieve breakthroughs, that's exactly what I was doing in my practitioner life. That's what I was facilitating in organizations, developing new products and helping them solve complex problems with interdisciplinary teams. And it's also what I lectured in my creative thinking module. So what, what, what I was a scholar of, what I was teaching and what I was doing in my practical life, we're all feeding one another. So it was a very enriching experience and, and decade. Uh, had I ever thought it would be a decade, I might have rethought it. Um, 
but those three things fed off each other. The, the journey of a PhD is actually quite similar to the journey of a startup, believe it or not. It requires resilience. It requires dedication, uh, passion for the cause. Um, and at the end of a PhD, you, you deliver a new piece of knowledge to the world. And, and much like a startup, it takes resilience and all of the things I mentioned, and you are bringing something new to market. So the journeys um, and the experience that I'd had and the isolation that I had experienced in my PhD is comparable to the periods of isolation that I've experienced in my startup. But actually, um, you're bringing something new to market and the definition of creativity is something that is new and has value. Those are the two things that we do in innovation, new and of value. And, uh, and therefore, the, it has been a very harmonious experience. And I don't think I'll ever stop studying it. And I don't think I'll ever stop being a practitioner of it. And it's interesting, I find, Geraldine, as I listen to Diane, is you know what she has done is she has done exactly what you recommended, which is that she has her business plan and her life plan. And the two of those work seamlessly together. Can I... Maybe ask, uh, I don't know whether this is a personal question or it could, you know, potentially pull in the heartstrings of those who are viewing, but my job is not to ask the nice questions. My job is to ask all the questions. Can I ask you, do you think, bearing in mind that you too have come from a very multifaceted career, do you think that women make specific sacrifices? Because the theme today is what it's like to be a woman entrepreneur today. And let's, let's take a hard look at everything. Do women make specific sacrifices, in your opinion, Geraldine? I mean, I think I'd be living in Coco Land if I was to answer the question in any other way, except absolutely they make um, loads of sacrifices. Um, you mentioned at the start of the programme about the law um, creating a, a more level playing pitch, but culturally we're still very behind. Um, down to just the nuances, women lean over just to keep the show on the road more. And I think all of the the information that is coming out of COVID is so we're in you know 2021 the vast majority of even child care and the responsibilities around it has fallen back on the women now why is that um we can say we can we can blame it on many facets but let's look i suppose we only thing we can do here today is speak generally i guess i'd like to say that yes we need to talk more with the men in the room too. And how do we collaborate as both genders in, in fixing a weightier problem that does seem to fall culturally on women at the moment a lot more. And I think we need to assess it from a point of view. How are the men in our lives um, or the, the parent that chooses to stay at home more or has feels under pressure to stay at home more, how, how are they less available in the partnership? And I think if we look at the lacks that the and the, the imbalance is creating, we'll really notice that it is going to be a spill out in our society. Um, so we need to look at it in the bigger picture rather than it just being the small items around childcare. And I'm not saying that they're a small item. By God, I know they're not. But it, it has to be something that we discuss with all of us rather than just hearing it from the voices of women or the main stay at home partner. And I'm sorry, I'm, I don't mean to 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 disallow or exclude, but, but, but I would say proportionately a lot of the women are staying at home more um, around work and sacrificing their careers. My career for sure is sacrificed. But here's the thing because I was aware that it was sacrificed, maybe I put in more work. But there again, I, what was the sacrifice of that? Maybe it was a sacrifice of energy. Maybe it was a sacrifice of my hobbies. I don't have one. I, I regret to admit. And I think it's healthy to have them. But yeah, I'm very time short as a woman that's an entrepreneur. And I think, you know, it's important that we realize that and it's important that we face up to it. It's important that we talk about it. And that, as you say, is that those conversations are had with, I'm, I'm going to put a corporate term on a non-corporate idea, is that when the stakeholders in your home or in your relationship, is that that yeah. conversation needs to be broadly spoken about and, and honestly. And can I also flip that then, Diane? Do you feel that mm. being a woman entrepreneur today, that there are specific opportunities too? Yes, I do. And I think... Um, 
you know, there are a lot of supports that are being put in place to particularly support women. And there are, and some of those are to, to plug the, the gaps that are there and to try and get the numbers up. And it is a numbers game. Uh, um, we do need more women doing more uh, starting up new companies and and engaging in in new pursuits and i think um with more supports and enhanced mentorship for women they can continue to thrive in that environment we're seeing the numbers uh, stacked against us all the time so i think it is moving in the right direction and we have role models now and we have the numbers are moving up but actually it's it, it, there's a lot more work to do there to enable that to, to really catch up in terms of that catching up and i'm going to go on my last question um Geraldine, I'll, I'll put it to you is that we have to be motivated to do it. And I'm saying that as a broadly collective society or group of women entrepreneurs of which the three of us are, or whether it's the TU Dublin University community, et cetera. But what do you feel motivates people today? I mean, if I was to go back to the entrepreneurs of the 80s or the 90s, are, are there different motivations uh, decades hence? Or what do you feel motivates people today? It's a really brilliant question. And I guess w one would have to answer it um, in relation to the stage they're at, um, what I, th I suppose here's the thing: we can often refer to the millennials, the under thirty four year olds, that typically want a different type of work um, relationship to maybe what my generation wanted. But, but when it all when it all boils down to one thing, what motivates us? What motivates us, and what motivates people I work with, is the acknowledgement that they're that their thoughts, their input matters. And that's timeless. So no matter what decade we're in, um, to, to, be, to be held um, in such a way that you, you held in high esteem, that your thoughts matter, that it is a contribution to society and that you're not, you're not excluded or you're not a number. Motivation comes from, I think, real connectedness between people. Um, and as busy as we ever get, and I, I, I could stay busy all day long, but when it comes to somebody I work with or that's in my environment, I will stop the clock and pause that moment and be with them because that connection or that genuine interaction is something that is doing a multitude of wonders for them. And it will also be doing it for me in the overall. So motivation for me is... I think people are motivated by connection and, and regard and attention to them. And you know what really strikes me about you both as we wrap up this panel is that conversation around connectedness. Geraldine, in your case, you talk about that sense of feeling connected and taking that moment out to be connected. And on the other hand, then Diane, you mentioned earlier on how not having that sense of connection is that red flag. You mentioned isolation, for example. And of course, I'm delighted to be connected to you both, uh, whose connection is connection. So on that note, I'm going to thank you so much indeed not just for your thoughts and for your feelings that you've shared with us, but actually the whole authentic way that you've brought your unique journeys to us because you have both brought teams and whether that's in an academic setting, in a work setting, you've brought your families to the fore as well. And you truly, truly, I can say for sure, have inspired our audience today. And speaking of our audience, I want to thank each and every single one of you for tuning in. This conversation is all around women entrepreneurs and what it is like to be women entrepreneurs today. And we wanted to give you the real story and by God, have we got it today. So on that note, I'm going to thank sincerely both of our guest speakers. So I would like to thank Dr. Diane Tangney from Atmos Q, as well as Geraldine Magner from Adiro. We really appreciate you and we really appreciate each and every person who has taken the time to be part of this series, including each and every viewer for this We Support series right here at TU Dublin. So on that note, I wish you all the very, very best. And as you pursue your journey as women entrepreneurs today and beyond, we wish you every success.